Chapter 11. When Zikolov awoke, his whole body hurt, like he'd been trampled by a herd of angry banthers. He groaned, not at all happy that he returned to the world of the living. Once his vision cleared, he was surprised to find that he was not still lying on the cold, hard, training room floor but rather on his soft bed. Someone had been tending to his injuries. There were both hot and cold compresses gently bandaged on the areas of his body that were bruised. One of his arms was wrapped in soft gauze. A soft, white bandage roll was wrapped firmly around his torso and his back. He searched the room for the healer in question and his golden yellow eyes landed on the silver form of his protocol droid he had yet to name. He cracked a small smile. Ah, hi there. The droid turned from where he had been sorting through medical supplies to look at him. Master Zikolov, you have sustained multiple injuries but none of them are life-threatening. The child was so glad he was already propped up against his pillow so he didn't have to strain his body to sit up. Did you do this? The child gestured towards the bandages covering his extremities. Yes, Master Zikolov. How do you feel? This was most peculiar. A protocol droid that was also programmed with medi-droid functions? He tried to sit up and sharp pain lanced through his chest, forcing him to lie back down with his eyes tightly closed. He hissed in pain and when he opened his eyes again the droid was standing right next to him with a needled syringe filled with yellow liquid. Zikolov tried squirming away. W what are you doing? What is that? This is to help relieve your pain, master. It will help you to rest and will speed up the healing process. Wouldn't back to patches be better? They would indeed. However, Count Dooku will not allow it. He wanted me to deliver this message to you once you finally regained consciousness. The droid activated a handheld recording device and played the message. The child suppressed a savage snarl when he heard the old man's voice and felt the hot rage and hate building up in his chest. My apprentice, I trust you have learned a valuable lesson today. Know this, you must learn to overcome your suffering. A true Sith fears neither death nor pain. You must focus and use your aggressive feelings, your anger, your hate, and your rage to conquer the agony you must be feeling. Our next lesson begins tomorrow. Rest assured it will not be physical. However, should you choose to express your pain by any means, you will suffer for it. Rest now my apprentice. There is much you need to learn. I will summon you in the morning. Do not be late. The recording ended with a brief hiss of static. Zikolov rolled his eyes in severe annoyance and released a pent-up growl. He had been tempted to use the force to rip the recording device from the droid's hand and crush it in one fist once the message began to play, but knew there would be severely negative consequences should he remain oblivious to what his master had said. There was no telling if the Count would try to surprise him with a pop quiz during tomorrow's lesson. Zikolov was too hurt and tired to offer up any more resistance when the droid approached him again with the syringe. He suppressed a flinch when the needle pierced his scaly skin and punctured a vein, pumping the yellow substance within him. The child felt an immediate change. The pain that had been viciously throbbing through his aching extremities and through his torso lessened considerably. He released a sigh of relief and felt his body sink further into the soft bedding and into the plush cushions. This was all very odd to him. He had paranoid suspicions about the droid currently tending to him. The Kalish boy really needed answers. But he wasn't going to attempt to carry on a long conversation with his droid until he finally had a name. His reptilian eyes focused on the serial number engraved on the droid's left shoulder plating. He knew that most droids were named based on their serial numbers but that was way too boring. Let's see, what could he name him? The droid wasn't a warrior or a soldier but for some reason the word sentinel kept coming to mind, seeing as how the droid always seemed to watch him. The child thought about it for a few minutes and finally settled on a suitable name. I'm going to call you Senti-7. How does that sound? The protocol droid nodded in acceptance. Very well, master. The droid turned his back on the child and began to clean the mess he had made while tending to the Kalish boy's injuries. 
Soon the pain reliever that had been administered began to take powerful hold of Zikolov and before the child could protest or resist, was pulled into a deep slumber. Once the droid was certain the boy was unconscious and had swept the area with his scanners to ensure that they were indeed alone and undetected, placed a small communications disc on the floor that soon projected the holographic image of General Grievous who had been awaiting the droid's report. The general was able to see what his droid could and saw the prone, unconscious form of his son laying on a bed wrapped in medical bandages. His holographic image turned to look at Senti-7 and he growled softly. What happened? Tell me everything. The droid reported what had occurred during Zikolov's first combat training session with the Count. The Kalish cyborg knew something like this would occur and hated the old man for it. What injuries has the boy sustained? Senti-7 emotionlessly responded. He did not go into explicit medical detail unless his creator gave the order and gave a simple, very general, analytic overview. Master Zikolov has sustained two cracked ribs, a fractured left arm, a sprained right ankle, mild internal trauma, damaged nerve endings, heavy bruising to all extremities, and a strained back. The volatile hate and deep loathing that Grievous already felt for Dooku tripled at this news. He was just itching, to wrap his geranium-clawed hands around the old man's throat and both choke and crush the life out of him. Daydreaming about murdering the Count did make him feel a little better but it unfortunately did not change the present circumstances surrounding his youngest child. See to it that my son has a rapid recovery by any means necessary. Dooku will show the boy no mercy and will not hesitate to kill him if he is weak. As you wish, General. Grievous turned his holographic head for a moment and stared almost wistfully at the unconscious form of his son for a moment looking for a brief second, as if he was contemplating if he would ever see him again. The look of regret within his reptilian eyes was lost behind his mask. He turned his attention back to his droid. Do not fail me, Sentinel, the Kalish cyborg pointed a holographic claw at the highly advanced robotic AI in warning. I understand, sir. You know what fate awaits you if you do. Grievous's eyes narrowed at that last statement as a growl escaped his throat. Order received and acknowledged. I will be awaiting your next report. Until that time, initiate complete calm link silence unless it is a dire emergency. Senti-7 nodded his robotic head in silent acknowledgement. The transmission was severed, flooding the room with soft quiet. An almost human-like sigh escaped the droid's vocalizer. He finished putting the medical supplies away and made sure young Zikolov was comfortable. If Zikolov's condition worsened, he would have to buy the Kalish child more time to heal. The devious droid had just the idea if that worst-case scenario were to occur. For now, the droid was going to return to his primary duties as one of Dooku's mechanized slaves, all the while, engaging in another one of his primary functions, namely, spying on the Count and reporting all of his activities to the General. He had recently come across valuable information regarding the possible location of Grievous's family. It soon became invalid and a complete dead end after Senti-7 learned that it had all been a ploy and a false lead for the Jedi to follow in order to get them off the Separatists' trail. The Jedi followed it all too eagerly, most likely believing young Zikolov would be amongst Grievous's other family members, placed there into hiding by Dooku himself, what the Jedi found at the coordinates supplied to them, was a dead moon and remnants of a civilization long past. While the Jedi were busy chasing false leads, Dooku himself was planning his next big move. The Sith Lord was overseeing a massive droid production, namely the assembly lines at Geonosis. That planet was a crown jewel to the Separatist cause. It was one of the largest manufacturing plants in Separatist-controlled space and cranked out over 700,000 droids per day. The plant had been in business for the last three weeks. The newly assembled droids that came fresh off of the assembly lines were shipped out to reinforce planetary systems weakened by Republic assaults. If word got out concerning the work they were doing there, Count Dooku knew it was only a matter of time before Geonosis became the Republic's new primary target. Which is why Dooku needed the child to assist him. Zikolov could see the future. Dooku could not. 
he would train Grievous's son the next couple of weeks and help the boy master his force visions and hopefully teach him how to purposefully use his foresight. Foresight was the first step towards actual battle meditation. It was most promising that this Kalish child already had an aptitude for this gift at such a young age. With any luck, the boy would help the separatists win the war. After which, the boy would have outlived his usefulness and would then be disposed of. That was his master Sidious's wish. However, Count Dooku had his own personal vendetta and was patient to wait for the opportune moment to gain the mantle of Sith Master. He planned to use Zikolov to help him achieve that feat. If he succeeded in assassinating his master Sidious, he would then be sure to remove any liabilities that might have the potential of spoiling his future plans concerning complete galactic conquest. General Grievous had the potential of being a possible such liability. Time would tell. If need be he would have his new apprentice remove Grievous from the equation. It would be most entertaining to watch father and son duel each other to the death. The victor would be his loyal subject for the remainder of his supreme rule as separatist overlord once the Republic was defeated. He had his credit chips betting on his apprentice. Dooku recognized that General Grievous had a soft spot for his son, though the general denied it, and knew that the cyborg Kalish wouldn't want to kill him. That would give Zikolov the upper hand, in addition to possessing the most powerful thing his father was devoid of, the Force. The son would soon become more powerful and far stronger than the father. Dooku planned on slaying his apprentice once Zikolov began to exhibit signs of becoming more powerful than the Count himself, once his main agenda was complete. It was the Sith way after all, for either the master or the apprentice to destroy the other. Zikolov would one day learn this and it would only be a matter of time before his apprentice turned on him. The Count had some countermeasures in place should that happen in the future, in all likelihood. The Count took care of other affairs and then retired for the night. Minus three hours later, Zikolov was caught in yet another vivid dream. In his dream he saw a large planet that he knew to be Geonosis. He remembered that he and his father had gone to a refueling station not far from it in the past before he was sent into Dooku's care. He felt and saw himself whiz through the atmosphere, almost like he was piloting a one-man craft. He looked down at the controls to see, not his scaly, child-sized Kalish hands, but large human hands. He heard a man's voice speaking and soon learned it was the voice of Obi-Wan Kenobi. He was the same Jedi that had been in his other vision when he and the other two Jedi were in space searching for him. The Jedi known as Obi-Wan landed his one-man fighter craft down onto the dust ball of a planet and got out to adjust something. This version of Obi-Wan looked slightly older than the one from his previous vision. He spoke with his A4 unit after tinkering with a communications array aboard the Star Fighter and then hopped back inside the cockpit, leaving the canopy open. I'm going to try to contact Anakin on Naboo, it's much closer. Anakin, Anakin do you copy? This is Obi-Wan Kenobi. After a moment of silence the human man sighed. He's not on Naboo, R4. I'm going to try to widen the range. The Jedi tinkered a bit more with his communication array. And then looked extremely baffled. I found Anakin's tracking beacon, but it's coming from Tatooine. What in the blazes is he doing there? I told him to stay on Naboo. The Jedi left his cockpit and began to walk away. Then the dream changed again. The boy saw Obi-Wan and the younger Jedi known as Anakin, along with some other human girl get chained up in the middle of an arena. They were going to be executed. Events in the dream skipped a lot and time seemed to fast forward. He saw a vast number of clone troopers and a large array of Jedi invading Geonosis. The factories there were decimated and the separatist droid armies were destroyed along with many of the fleeing battle cruisers. He watched in fascinated awe as he witnessed the destruction of the separatist armada. Much of which, was in great detail. It was almost like watching a hollow movie. He saw Obi-Wan and Anakin escape and chase after Count Dooku where they engaged in a vicious lightsaber duel. The Jedi apprentice got his arm sliced off by one of the Sith's red lightsabers and Obi-Wan was also badly wounded. Then he saw the little green Jedi master nose as Yoda, the one that appeared in that other vision from before. 
He fought Dooku and came to learn that Dooku had once been a Jedi, he had once been Yoda's student. The Count fled the scene and escaped. His dreams of foresight soon turned into a nightmare. He dreamt that his father, General Grievous was engaged in a lightsaber duel with Obi-Wan Kenobi to the death on some other planet that was obviously not Geonosis. The clones soon invaded, prompting Grievous to make another daring getaway. After Zekalov saw the chase between Obi-Wan on some kind of creature and his father piloting some other kind of ground vehicle, watched helplessly on the sidelines as his father, now devoid of any lightsabers or electro-staffs, take on the Jedi bare-handed. He seemed to be doing rather well. Zekalov jumped up and down in excitement. Kill him father. You can take him. His father had to win, he just had to. His father picked up a blaster pistol and in an act of desperation tried to shoot Obi-Wan. The Jedi managed to pry open Grievous's chest armor. He knocked Obi-Wan away from him and seemingly threw the Jedi off the edge of the hangar they were in. The general of the droid armies picked up one of the Magna Guard's electro-staffs and twirled it, ready to end the fight as he stalked towards the edge where his foe had fallen. Obi-Wan reappeared, barely hanging on, and used the force to pull Grievous's discarded blaster pistol into his awaiting palm. He witnessed his father's cruel murder at the Jedi's hands and screamed in agony and with rage when he saw Obi-Wan use the blaster pistol to savagely shoot his father's exposed organ sac beneath his geranium armor plating multiple times. The Jedi showed no mercy and shot his father repeatedly. His father shrieked in agony before he erupted into a ball of flame as he exploded from the inside out, soon falling to the ground with a heavy thud still on fire, his insides melting and burning. Father. No. Zekalov felt the most rage and hate he'd ever felt in his entire existence for the Jedi scum, especially when he heard Obi-Wan's last remark as he stared down at his father's corpse. So uncivilized. The Jedi threw the blaster pistol aside. Zekalov stood, now crying over his father's broken body. He snarled as his normally yellow-hewn, reptilian irises began to change to a Sith red. I hate you Obi-Wan Kenobi. I'll kill you for this. He watched the Jedi walk calmly away, leaving Zekalov alone with what was left of his father's still smoldering remains. His emotions built as his fear, rage, hatred, grief, and agony all swirled together in a roaring maelstrom within him. He threw his head back and looked up at the rocky ceiling of the cavern and screamed. Father, Zekalov bolted awake in bed, feeling sweaty and clammy. He ignored the pain the sudden movement caused him and placed a hand over his racing heart. He shuddered as he attempted to breathe more slowly in order to calm his rapidly beating heart that felt like it was going to pound right out of his chest. He reached for the glass of water on the nightstand beside the bed that Senti Seven had left him and took a sip. The cool, sweet, purified water slid gently down his throat and helped to calm his frazzled nerves. The child knew for certain, without any doubt whatsoever, that the nightmare he just had, was the future. He didn't have a clue when all of those events were going to occur but he could feel it in his soul, that the destruction of the Separatist army and the death, no, murder of his father at the Jedi's hands, was going to happen. He was eager to tell Count Dooku all about it. He felt deep down, instinctively, to keep the details concerning his father's future death a secret from his new master. He would of course tell him everything concerning the fall of Geonosis and about Dooku's victory over Obi-Wan Kenobi and Anakin. He grinned sardonically when he decided he would leave the part out about Yoda arriving on the scene to beat him into a hasty retreat. The Kalish boy used a remote beside his bed to call his droid back to him. Senti-7 entered his room about thirty seconds later and approached his bedside. Is everything all right, master? Unbeknownst to the Kalish youngling, Senti-7 had a hidden monitor installed within the headboard of the bedframe that he had a direct uplink with that alerted him to any abnormal changes in Zekalov's vital signs while the boy was sleeping. He had been instantly alerted when the child exhibited accelerated heart rate, abnormal breathing rhythm, and other such stress indicators. He stood by his master's side and awaited an explanation. Zekalov shivered and pulled the blankets up and looked at him. I, I had a nightmare. What was it about? 
Zikolov looked uncertain, unsure if he should tell this droid or not. After all, didn't this droid work for Dooku? Will you keep a secret Senti-7? You have to promise not to tell anyone. Especially Dooku, he frowned deeply in disgust. I promise, Master, the droid nodded his head slowly. Zikolov looked down at his still-bandaged torso and then back up at the droid. How do I know I can trust you? Is it your function to report everything to Dooku concerning what I do and what I say? Are you his spy? If Senti-7 could laugh, he would have at that moment. It was rather ironic, really. He was the exact opposite of what the boy feared. Rest assured Master Zikolov, I am not one of Dooku's droids. Zikolov's head titled as his expression turned into one of confusion. What are you then? Senti-7 inclined his head towards the child. Will you keep a most treasured secret, Master? I swear on my life and by the honor of my people that whatever secret you are about to entrust me with, will remain so. I was not assembled on a manufacturing line like the other protocol droids here in Dooku's fortress. It was your father who created me. He is my one true master. Now what secret did you want me to keep for you, Master Zikolov? Zikolov could only stare at him with a mixture of shock and disbelief. This is a joke right? Did Dooku program you to say that? Droids do not lie, sir. Prove that my father made you. That's an order, Zikolov gingerly crossed his arms over his chest while shooting the droid a defiant look, that in the past had made his father genuinely smile when he was sure his son wasn't looking. Can you prove that your father made you, master? Zikolov was taken aback and just stared at his droid completely stunned and baffled by the sheer complexities surrounding Senti-7's programming. There was more to this protocol droid than met the eye. He was beginning to believe him. Only his father would create a droid with this blatantly cynical personality. Aha. Uh -huh. Well the less I know about you the better. I don't want Dooku to find out about you if you are telling me the truth. For now I will take you at your word. If you betray me and tell Count Dooku what I'm about to tell you, I swear by my father's name that I will dismember you piece by piece and sell you for spare parts at the nearest spaceport. The glare he sent Senti-7 was near identical to the one that Grievous had sent the droid hours earlier. Your secret is safe with me, master. Zikolov tapped a clawed digit against the water glass he held in his hand as he stared down at it in silent contemplation before speaking again. It was about the future, a really bad future. Senti-7 was secretly recording both audio and visuals of the child to send to Grievous with his next report. The general of the droid armies programmed him to report all details surrounding his son's dreams and visions concerning the future. Zikolov took in a deep breath and looked away from Senti-7 for a moment as he tried to gather his wits. When he spoke, his voice was soft and thick with emotion though he didn't shed any tears. It was about the end of the separatists, and about the future death. Of my father. Senti-7 nodded. What happened? Zikolov went into very long extravagant detail, recounting every bit of memory while it remained fresh within his mind. After he was finished he yawned and shook his head and gave the droid a tired smile. I probably should have recorded this in my datapad or in the very least, had the sense to write all of this down, the boy sighed and relaxed back into his pillows and snuggled beneath his blankets. His eyes drooped tiredly. He gave Senti-7 a soft smile, thanks for listening. At least, I have you for a friend, even if you are just a droid. It's good to know that I'm not as alone as I thought. Of course, master. I will be near if you need me. The child would have thanked him but had already fallen asleep. Senti-7 watched him silently for a moment and then stood in a corner of the room and powered down for a while. General Grievous would be very interested in his next report. Until then, both Zikolov and Senti-7, each had their secrets to keep. The droid was designed to protect his charge and would continue to do so until the end of his function. Zikolov on the other hand, upon his last few nanoseconds of consciousness before falling into a dreamless slumber, had sworn within his warrior's heart that he would not betray his father's newest and most unique creation. 
he would protect Senti Seven as he would a true friend. The boy knew that in doing so, he was protecting his father. He would die for his father and would do everything in his power to prevent future events from unfolding as had been foreseen. For now, all the child was going to do was sleep, and dream of happier times before the dawning of a new day. Tomorrow could, quite possibly, change the fortunes of all. Chapter 12 The son of General Grievous turned ten years old. As a gift, his father found a way to contact him with Senti Seven's help and spoke with him for a short time. The conversation wasn't as long as Zikolov would have liked but he understood the importance of secrecy and didn't want Count Dooku catching them. The general smiled at him beneath his war mask, his golden eyes showed Zikolov the warm feelings that his father had for him. The boy was still bandaged as the remaining wounds healed but was able to stand on his own two feet and walk for a little while. He sat on the edge of his bed and looked at the holographic projection of his father standing right in front of him. Senti Seven kept his scanners operating at high efficiency to warn father and son in the event that any unwelcomed visitors approached from down the hall. I've missed you, father. And I have you, my son. I remembered what you said. And I've been doing as you told me too. Grievous nodded. I know you have. I want you to succeed in your training so that one day you may return to me. General Grievous broke down into a coughing fit, secretly triggered when he fought to keep the emotion out of his voice. Father, when will we be together again? General Grievous looked down at the floor with one clawed hand behind his back apparently deep in thought for a moment. It was the one innocent question his son always asked and the one he never had an answer for. I don't know. I can't promise anything Zikolov, but I will try to ensure that we meet again soon if only for a few moments. The Kalish boy nodded slowly with a smile blooming on his young face, clearly happy at such a prospect. Be good, my son. Do as the Count demands. Even if what he commands is dishonorable. You will regain your honor the day you are free of him. Remember that this arrangement is only temporary, until you have grown in knowledge and in strength. Yes, father. I will, I promise. That's my boy, Grievous's golden eyes crinkled up at the corners, indicating a smile beneath his war mask. Zikolov smiled back as he heard his father's voice for what would be the last time in months. Goodbye, Zikolov, until next we speak. Goodbye, father. The transmission was cut, the general's holographic image shrank down and disappeared within the communications disc on the floor. Zikolov used the force to pull the disc to his hand. He wasn't as skilled, so it took him great concentration and effort to achieve the feat. The boy knew that Dooku would be training him with force techniques for the next three months. The Count hadn't told him as of yet, he just knew based on a force vision he'd had. It was kind of annoying when they happened in random uncontrolled episodes. The child looked forward to when he would master the ability to willfully control them. There was so much to learn that oftentimes the Kalish boy felt overwhelmed at the prospect of it all. His father if he had been with him, would have reminded him to take it one day at a time, one didn't become a skilled warrior overnight. Zikolov did confront Dooku and spoke to him of the dreams he had concerning the fall of Geonosis and the annihilation of the separatist army. His Sith master was pleased to learn of his apparent success in the future duel between Obi-Wan and his apprentice Anakin Skywalker. Count Dooku was none the wiser that Zikolov withheld other information, pertaining to Yoda's confrontation with the Sith master. For the next three to four weeks, Count Dooku trained young Zikolov strictly in regards to force meditation and honing his gift of foresight. They did not return to lightsaber drills immediately after the beating Zikolov endured beforehand. It was not an act of mercy on the Count's part. It was a matter of priorities. It was necessary for Zikolov to learn to master the Force before he would be remotely experienced enough to complete his lightsaber training. The child had about another three years before he was initiated into the ranks of the Sith. The boy would be subjected to intense trials before his graduation. As Zikolov had foreseen, Count Dooku did give him force-related training for three months straight before they integrated lightsaber training in addition to other lessons. The child was a fast learner, which was a really good thing. 
he had to be. Or risk certain death. The Count was harsh and unmerciful but it was shaping the boy into a strong, hardened soul. Over the course of a couple years, Zikolov had grown exceptionally strong in both body and in mind. The twelve-year-old had learned to mind his master and do as he was instructed. If he made an error, the young warrior was able to handle whatever punishment Duku unleashed upon him, whether it be physical or psychological without any complaint. If he knew the Count was about to physically abuse him, he did not cower, whimper, or recoil but stood firmly in place with a level gaze and with Kalish pride, he took his torture and punishments like a true warrior, unflinching and devoid of any cries of pain. His father would be proud of him. He became very proficient in all of his trainings and grew stronger in the force. He had developed a clear ability to access and control force visions, namely ones concerning the future fall of Geonosis. By the time he turned twelve, Duku had given him a very difficult test. Zikolov was not overly fond of that memory. He was called into the training room where Duku was standing above a prisoner of some sort. The prisoner had his hands tied behind his back and a cloth sack covered his head. The boy was uncertain of why his master would call him here in regards to this. Yes, master? Zikolov, this is a prisoner of war. Let me introduce you to him. The Sith Lord ripped the cloth off the man's head to reveal a bloodied and bruised face. The bearded man looked worn and haggard. The Kalish youngling wondered how long he had been held captive. He looked weak and malnourished. He had the Republic's mark tattooed on his left shoulder. This is our enemy. We are at war. You will soon have to choose which side you want to be on. Ours, or his, Dooku sneered cruelly down at the dazed human. The prisoner began to understand where Dooku was going with his little speech. His face paled considerably. It is finally time for you Zikolov, to learn a most serious lesson. In war, it's either you, or them. You must learn to accept this and shun all guilt and shame. Mercy is for the weak. Duku ignited a crimson lightsaber and shoved the man down on the floor. The Sith Master waved Zikolov forward and gave him the lightsaber. Kill him Zikolov. The boy was uncertain and his eyes darted from Duku's hardened, merciless gaze to the prisoner's silently pleading one. The child looked down at the lightsaber in his hands and squeezed his eyes closed with clenched teeth. He knew what he had to do, he was just having a hard time accepting it. It was dishonorable to slay an enemy who had no weapon. He was not meant to be an executioner. I said kill him, boy. Duku snarled angrily. Zikolov opened his eyes and took a deep breath. He remembered what his father told him about obeying the Count even if what he commanded was dishonorable. His father wasn't kidding about the dishonor part. The child internally suppressed all emotion until he was numb. He didn't want to feel guilt concerning the murder of a helpless prisoner. He quickly swung the lightsaber before he could allow his mind second thoughts. He passed his test successfully. He didn't even hear Duku congratulating him. Zikolov handed the now deactivated lightsaber hilt back to his master wordlessly and left the training room, feeling as if he'd just lost a part of his very soul. Zikolov was often plagued with the nightmare concerning his father's death at the hands of Obi-Wan Kenobi, but knew it wasn't going to happen for another few years at least. Senti-7 had already delivered that particular report to Grievous the week after the droid revealed to Zikolov his true origins. The child had been able to communicate with his father every now and then. Over the course of time, Grievous did begin to see a change in his son. He recognized both the good changes and the bad. His son had grown very strong physically and mentally but his child's original, innocent, fun-loving, compassionate personality had begun to fade. In place of the original temperament, his boy had grown strictly serious, rarely ever smiled, and never laughed. It had been a long time since Grievous had even heard his son laugh. He missed that laugh, and the rage he felt for Dooku had only intensified during the passing months. The general was also angry at himself, for he was as much to blame for his son's transformation as the Sith Master. Then came the day when father and son were finally permitted to meet in person at long last. 
Count Dooku took Zekel off along to meet with his father, strictly on business matters. His son was now completely devoid of his training saber. That was one of the first things Grievous noticed when he saw his son walk in the room with the Count for their business meeting. The child sat beside Dooku throughout their meeting and Grievous had to fight the urge to focus all of his attention on his son. Zikolov was garbed in traditional Sith attire and had his Kalish war mask on. Grievous's reptilian eyes would dart occasionally to meet Zikolov's stoic gaze to see the boy had his own identical, golden eyes fixed upon him the entire time. The general tried not to be distracted and at one point spaced out while Dooku was talking to him when he glanced at his son's rather blank expression and internally wondered what the boy was thinking. Was Zikolov angry at him? He had become very difficult to read. He wasn't at all like the old Zikolov he had known, who had been like an open book when it came to what he was thinking and feeling. General, are you paying attention? Reva snapped his head back to look at Dooku and nodded. Yes, Count. Proceed. The old man looked mildly annoyed at Grievous's inattentiveness. He repeated the previous question with a frown. Have our assets been relocated? They were moved from Geonosis to our secondary location. The manufacturing and production of all droid models requested have resumed and will continue until you so order it, Lord Dooku. And what of the shipyards? The Alpha site remains concealed with cloaking and holographic technologies and remain undiscovered. The other we've run into some difficulties. Dooku narrowed his eyes although he remained calm despite the iciness and warning tone of voice. What sort of difficulties? Grievous wasn't looking forward to giving Dooku this particular report. A couple Rodian technicians were sighted leaving the shipyard after closing hours last week. They returned three days later but their credentials did not match up. We launched an immediate investigation. The bodies of the original technicians were found 58 miles from the shipyard. The two impostors fled. We pursued them but they, they escaped. Count Dooku's face darkened and he clenched his hands into fists and did not bother to hide his anger. You mean to tell me, that two Republic spies slipped past your guard? They could jeopardize our entire operation. Do you not realize the consequences for such a blunder, you idiotic fool? General Grievous having worked so long with Count Dooku, was rather used to the Sith's rage-induced rants, so was therefore unfazed by his master's verbal aggression. He sought to appease him. My Lord Dooku, the facility has been moved off-site to a more remote location in a nearby, uncharted star system that is not in any of the Republic's known databases. We have taken drastic measures to keep the shipyard's new whereabouts top secret. Very few know of its existence and the ones that do, are either devout separatist loyalists or victims of our newly christened Death Squad, Grievous chuckled rather darkly in a gleeful sort of way while rubbing his clawed hands together. Count Dooku had indeed been appeased, at least for now, and was eager to know more. What sort of Death Squad? A deadly task force newly designed to eliminate any potential threats to the facility. Dooku nodded slowly and leaned back in his chair. Droids, I presume? Grievous nodded. Newly upgraded assassin droids with stealth mode and cloaking technology. They were beta tested with most promising results before integrating them within the facility and the outlaying regions surrounding the shipyard. What were the results? Grievous chuckled darkly again and reached beneath the table and then dropped the object in question in front of the count. It was a clone captain's helmet, dented and spattered with flecks of human blood. It was well known to all, how difficult it was to kill a soon-to-be clone commander. They were the most intelligent and the most experienced of all clones. Few were ever given such a high-ranking position. The separatists had managed to capture one in the past but the prisoner was unyielding to their interrogation and torture techniques and died within a month. The Republic did a good job safeguarding their most valuable secrets and intel. The clone commanders as well as the captains were more than willing to die for the Republic and were the least likely to betray them. The separatists had recently posted a bounty on clone commanders Cody and Rex for the sum of one million credits each, dead or alive. Without those two commanders leading the majority of the clones, 
the Republic would be crippled on some level. Now that they had Zikolov's force gift at their disposal, any other clone commanders besides Cody and Rex were to be terminated on sight. There were other ways the separatists could win the war. Dooku raised an eyebrow and looked a little skeptical. How did you come about this, General? We sent the Death Squad out to meet a small garrison of clones that had been intent on sabotaging one of our critical research outposts. They were slain in a matter of seconds, this really did have the Sith Lord's attention. Seconds? Are you sure you aren't over-exaggerating? Grievous cackled madly and pulled up a security video and projected it above the table as a hall of it. It showed about fourteen clones exiting a gunship all splitting up to go separate ways to achieve their individual assignments. The majority of them didn't even make it ten feet before the screams and blood began they mysteriously started dropping dead one after another. The first two were assaulted by some invisible entities and didn't even have a chance to fire their blasters. Their helmets flew off after they were violently kicked down, revealing the scarred faces of two troopers, one of which was a clone veteran. Their necks were quickly broken by deadly, invisible hands. Before their bodies even hit the ground, the rest in the near vicinity were quickly dispatched. A couple clone troopers fired their blasters in the direction of one of their fallen brethren after that particular clone's head came clean off. They shouted and screamed for backup amidst all the confusion as clone troopers were beaten, broken, and killed in a whirlwind of chaos. The few clones that had made it beyond the drop-off point had been alerted to the other troopers' screams and returned to investigate, only to meet a doomed fate themselves. The last clone standing had been the clone captain who had been trying desperately to send a distress signal out when he helplessly witnessed the deaths of all his underlings. He was lifted up by an invisible force and his body was slammed violently against the side of the gunship a few times. It showed the clone kicking an invisible assailant off, giving him a chance to grab a blaster pistol beside him. He fired off a few rounds but didn't seem to hit anything he shouted out a challenge that was gladly met. Show yourself. Before he could fire off another shot his invisible attacker, quickly and quite unexpectedly, broke the clone's arm that was holding the weapon eliciting a scream of pain from the clone captain. He was lifted up into the air by his throat. The invisible assassin droid decloaked revealing its true form. It was a solid metallic black and was thin and sleek but still intimidating. It looked a little similar to a commando droid unit but was larger in size. One by one, the additional eleven droids dropped their cloaks, all of them congregating near the last doomed clone. The droid holding the captain by the throat, pulled a weapon from a sheath on its back. Before he could utter another word, the clone captain was mercilessly impaled with the vibro sword. His helmet slid off after his body slumped over and the droid re-cloaked and retrieved the helmet. The entire assassination of the fourteen clones took approximately fifty-eight seconds. All traces of their whereabouts were either concealed or erased. The Republic received the report that the intel concerning our facility was faulty and that the clone garrison's dropship had been waylaid and destroyed by pirates after they completed their mission. The Republic never sent another team to investigate. Zikolov had been silent the entire time, simply taking in all of the information. He knew not to speak unless spoken to. Count Dooku smiled. You have done well General, despite your rather disappointing failures. I have brought your son here to discuss with you in greater detail one of the Republic's next missions. He has learned much and his knowledge of future events is paramount to the survival and success of the Separatist campaign. Both adults turned their attention on him and Zikolov took the obvious cue to start speaking. When he spoke, he sounded far more mature than Grievous remembered. He listened intently to what his son had to say. The two Republic spies that escaped, reported directly to the Jedi Council. The Jedi did in fact go to the previous location of the shipyard you were mentioning before you relocated it and found no evidence that the shipyard had even existed. While this would normally have closed the case, the Jedi were still convinced that the two infiltrators' report remained true and have resumed their search. The two escaped spies are about to embark on a mission entrusted to them by the Republic High Command. 
they are going to be accompanied by a young Jedi Padawan by the name of Ahsoka. Her mission is to ensure the safety of the two Republic informants. Do you know where they are going? Rivas questioned hopefully. Zikolov nodded solemnly and looked his father in the eyes. They would be traveling to the planet of his father's future murder at the hands of the Jedi Obi-Wan. They are going to the planet Utapau. I'm afraid, I don't specifically know the exact location they will be on the planet. I just know that they will be heading for a cantina of some sort where they are to meet with a possible separatist traitor. I know for certain that these events will take place seven days from now. Zikolov half smiled at his father and gave him a subtle nod with a twinkle in his eye, indicating he knew something concerning the both of them that was soon going to take place just before Dooku began speaking again. The two spies must be eliminated. If the informant they are meeting is a separatist traitor, that individual must also be terminated. What of the Jedi that will be accompanying them? Rivas twitched a clawed hand as if anticipating the opportunity to be the one charged with assassinating her. That is why your son is here, General. You will accompany Zikolov down to the planet, find these spies and the separatist traitor and deal with them, that is your mission. Confronting and slaying the Jedi Padawan is Zikolov's task and his alone. General Grievous nodded in acceptance. Count Dooku narrowed his eyes dangerously at Grievous and gave him a serious warning. Do not interfere with Zikolov's mission, do we understand one another? Yes, Lord Dooku. We will prepare to depart immediately. Dooku stood from his chair and handed Zikolov a black, velvet pouch filled with an assortment of tools and supplies for a secondary assignment for his young student. The Kalish boy took it without question although a brief expression of curiosity crossed his face beneath his mask. He resisted the childish urge to peek inside the sealed pouch and silently awaited an explanation from his master. If you want to defeat your new Jedi adversary, you must successfully construct your first real lightsaber. You have less than seven days to complete it. Do not return to me until your mission has been met with complete success, Dooku looked down at his apprentice seriously. Yes, master. I'm sure I've reminded you before what punishment awaits you, should you fail. Zikolov bowed both respectfully and submissively. He looked up at the count with fiery determination burning in his golden, reptilian eyes. I will not fail you, master. After you have completed your first mission successfully, you will then face your first trial and go to Korriban to the tomb of Razor, a famous Sith Lord who has been lost to the fabrics of time and retrieve an artifact I will assign to you at that appointed time. It will be perilous and few have ever returned from the tomb alive. You will be intrigued to know what history lays there. If you fail the current mission I'm entrusting you and your father with, you will not be granted the honor of embarking upon your first Sith trial and will have to wait until you've proven your worth. Zikolov nodded and held the pouch containing the essentials necessary to construct his first lightsaber against his chest. I won't let you down master. Dooku smiled at him before turning to Grievous. You will both have to leave the fleet behind in separatist space and travel to your objective discreetly. We shall do so accordingly, Grievous nodded his head once and then turned around and began to leave the room. Zikolov said farewell to Count Dooku and followed after his father silently. Count Dooku watched them leave and then boarded his own cruiser, departing soon after to return to his secret abode. Father and son walked side by side in companionable silence for a few minutes. We finally get to see each other again in person, and I'm at a loss of what to say, Zikolov turned his masked head away sheepishly while rubbing the back of his neck. Grievous nodded and slowed his long strides to stand above his rapidly growing son. Zikolov now stood a couple feet taller than he had since their farewell two years ago. We have much to discuss during our impending journey. Zikolov tied the satchel containing the parts for constructing his first lightsaber to his belt and then went to retrieve a duffel bag full of necessary essentials for their trip. He boarded a small cargo craft that was purchased from a smuggler on Coralia and fired up the engines. General Grievous widened his eyes in surprise. You know how to pilot a starship? 
Zikolov nodded without turning around from his work, but when he did he smiled at his father's incredulous expression that he could still read behind the mask and at his father's posture which clearly indicated he was having a hard time believing all of this. Yes father. I've been flying Dooku's shuttle to and from his boring separatist councils. He made me learn about six months ago. Zikolov flipped the final switch on the console that completed the pre-flight sequence and took his place in the pilot's chair. Grievous was very reluctant to allow his twelve-and-a-half-year-old son to take command of the vessel and had half a mind to drag his son out of the pilot's chair and fly the craft himself. It wasn't that he didn't have faith in Zikolov's abilities, it was more or less the fact he was having a hard time adjusting to the fact that his son had grown so much. He had secretly been hoping to be the one to give his son his first flying lesson. He missed out on that chance and deep down inside, it actually stung a little. What other important things had he missed out on in his son's life? He got in the co-pilot's chair and strapped himself in. Zikolov placed both hands on the flight controls and lifted off. He expertly maneuvered the craft away from the rest of the separatist fleet and once they were out a safe distance, punched in the coordinates for Utapau and pulled a lever down to jump to light speed. He and his father really did have a lot of catching up to do. Their flight would take them at least two days, giving them another five to locate the cantina that the Republic miscreants would meet. The soon-to-be thirteen-year-old was a little excited at the prospect of successfully completing his first real mission. Grievous sat silently for a few minutes allowing the wheels in his mind to turn as the gravity of their assignments began to weigh heavily on him. His son would be fighting a Jedi, with real lightsabers. The father in him felt the boy was still too young to take on a Jedi all by himself. Even if that Jedi was a child herself. Grievous thought about slaying the Jedi whelp himself and just give Zikolov all the credit. The general knew better. Dooku had many spies that reported directly to him regarding whether or not his loyal subjects completed their assigned tasks. Grievous knew that there was no stopping the inevitable. His son would not remain a child for long. This was Zikolov's chance to earn great honor by slaying one of their most hated Jedi enemies. This would also prove to the Count that his son was still worthy of life. His son's mission had to remain his own. It was a little hard for Grievous to accept but he knew it had to be this way. The general glanced over at his son who was adjusting one of the instruments on the overhead panel. He was tempted to just give Zikolov a lightsaber rather than have him build his own. Yet again, this was a chance for the infamous general of the droid armies to witness and quite possibly learn himself, how to construct a lightsaber. The Kalish warlord never had to construct his own. He just collected lightsabers from his slain Jedi enemies. His son had stopped fiddling with the ship's controls and reclined in his chair. He closed his eyes as if resting but softly spoke and broke the silence. I'm not mad at you. Grievous was snapped out of his reverie and looked at Zikolov in mild surprise. What? I said, I'm not mad at you. Grievous could only stare at him in complete bewilderment was staring at his son that griffing obvious during the meeting. He had tried to be discreet. No wonder Dooku had been losing patience with him. How could you have possibly known what I was thinking? He had internalized the unspoken question concerning whether his son was angry with him or not. How did the boy know? He was really curious to know Zikolov's secret. Zikolov opened his eyes to look at his father. During the meeting today, I sensed your nervous paranoia. Grievous scoffed. Bah! That's ridiculous. I never have nervous paranoia. Zikolov removed his war mask and ran a hand over his scaly face, only to turn and give his father a flat look. He narrowed his gold reptilian eyes at Grievous. Yes. You did. No I didn't. Grievous retorted with a huff while turning his head away from his son to stare at the wall beside him. Father, just admit it. Grievous narrowed his eyes at Zikolov and growled out one word. Never. You can't deny it. Zikolov persisted as a smile began tugging at the corners of his lips. When the general turned his head in order to deny it he was met with a smiling face of his son. The words instantly died in his throat. 
Oh how he had missed that smile. Pretty soon Grievous found himself smiling as well and let out a humoured chuckle. My son knows me too well. Zikolov soon turned serious again and set the ship on autopilot. He slid out of the pilot's chair and untied the small satchel from his belt and peered inside to find the necessary parts and tools to begin construction of his first lightsaber. Well, I guess I better get to work on this. I don't want to face the Jedi without a weapon. Grievous nodded silently and watched his son sit cross-legged on the floor. Zikolov dumped the contents on the cabin's floor mats. One silver piece bounced away out of Zikolov's reach. The boy stretched a hand out and using the force, called the object in question back to his awaiting hand. Grievous's eyeballs nearly popped clean out of his masked head when he witnessed the spectacle. Sure he'd seen other force users do the same thing but it was quite different seeing one of his children doing it. Zikolov caught his father's incredulous expression and laughed. Grievous snapped out of his shocked daze at the sound of his son's laughter. He closed his eyes for a moment and savoured the sweet, happy sound and tried committing it to long-term memory. It had been nearly over a year since he'd last heard it. Maybe deep down, his boy was still the same old Zikolov he had known before sending him away. It gave him some hope. Father, are you okay? The general opened his eyes and looked down at his child. I've never been better. Grievous nodded, feeling like some of the darkness that had plagued his bitter heart had lifted. It was a good feeling, he only wished it would last. He gazed fondly down at his youngest son and watched him for the next four hours as Zikolov tried to assemble the lightsaber, sometimes throwing in semi-helpful suggestions when the boy would run into a difficult problem. He wanted to help his son but firstly he didn't know a criffing thing when it came to constructing a lightsaber and secondly, this was Zikolov's assignment. Father and son spent the next two days simply enjoying each other's company while Zikolov worked on his weapon assemblage, both wishing that this time together would never end.